The Man-Eating Tiger. Protestations of fidelity and admiration greeted King Kanishka. From all sides, when he retired to his private rooms, after having shaken hands with the conspirators, he had conquered his enemies, not by the power of arms, as he had done before in battle, but that by the superiority of his mind. It was at this moment that a messenger arrived who had been sent by the custodian of King Subahu's summer palace, saying, Sir King, send your hunters to the summer palace with elephants and soldiers. For a man-eating tiger has been seen in its garden and parks, and all the people living in the neighborhood are sore afraid of the beast. Then the generals of the south shouted, Great king and sire, allow us to go to the summer palace to hunt the tiger, for we are anxious to distinguish ourselves and prove to the world that we are valiant soldiers and good hunters. And they received permission to be the foremost in the hunt, and after a hasty preparation, they set out the same evening. But the two kings and their retinue, with many officers, followed them. On the following day, Chiraka, however, stayed behind at the command of King Kanishka to observe the courtiers and counselors of King Sabahu and keep an eye upon the populace of the city, the capital of Magadha. Chiraka sat at a window in company with the vulnerable with the venerable uh, Achpagosha to see the suit of the two kings with their hunters and elephants leaving the city. And Chiraka addressed the sage saying, my reverend friend, I learned much yesterday from King Kanishka by watching his mode of retreating enemies. Truly, I understand the doctrine of the Tathagata. Better now, and if I had lived for many years in the monastery and studied all the wisdom of the monks, how much evil can be avoided by discretion? And should not mortals blame themselves for all the ills that befall them? But there is this doubt that vexes my mind. If Amitabha, the omnipresent, the eternal, the omnibeneficent source of all wisdom, fashions the world and determines our destinies. Why should not life be possible without suffering? However, the first sentence of the four great truths declares that life itself is suffering. If that be so, no amount of discretion could give us happiness so long as we live. And on the other hand, how can Amitabha permit innumerable things to suffer innocently for conditions which they did not create themselves? My young friend replied, Achvagosha, the first great truth is truly obvious to one who knows the nature of life. Life consists of separation and combination. It is a constant meeting and parting and has in store both pains and pleasures. Prove to me that life be possible without any change. And I will begin to doubt the first of the four great truths. But if life is suffering, you know, discontent, no being has a right to blame Mataba for existing. All beings exist by their own karma. They are the incarnation of deeds of their former existences. They are such as they are by their own determination, having fashioned themselves under the influence of circumstances. Now, I really can't think of any case where it wouldn't, be, wouldn't make more sense that a person wasn't reincarnated, but By Mataba, all beings are merely educated in the school of life. Some have gained more insight than others. Some love the light, others hate it. Some rise to the pure heights of Buddhahood, and others grovel in the dust to take delight in badness and deeds of darkness. Mataba 
is like the rain that falls upon the earth without discrimination. The seeds of herbs assimilate the water that falls from the clouds of heaven and a refreshing spring shower. To grow herbs, uh, to grow to be herbs of each of its kind, fern spores become ferns, acorns change the water into the leaves and wood and bark of oak trees, and the germs of fruit trees fashion it into fruit, each of its own kind, in the mangoes, bananas, dates, figs, pomegranates, and other savory fruits. Mataba is the same to all, as the water of the refreshing rain is the same. Diverse creatures make a different use of the benefits of truth, and each one is responsible for itself. Each one has originated in ignorance by its own blind impulses. Each one in its own field of experience has learned the lesson of life in its own way, and each one can blame no one but itself for what it is and has become, except that it ought to be grateful for the light that Amitabha sheds upon the course of its development. Amitabha is not a god that would assert himself or care for worship and adoration. Well, certainly, whatever title we have for God is not it's not something that, um, you know, that it needs it, right? It's us that needs such things. He does not think and act and do deeds. He is not Ishvara, not Sakra, not Indra, not Brahma. He is the norm of all existence, the goodwill, the order and the intrinsic harmony that shows itself in cause and effect in the bliss of goodness and the curse of evil doing, he is above all these so called gods and everything that has been fashioned by him according to the eternal ordinances of his constitution. We are not creatures of Amitabha, we are creatures of our own making. Life starts in ignorance, it begins with blind impulses, and life's start is life's own doing. But as soon as an impulse acts and is reacted upon, it is encompassed by the good law, and thus it is educated by Amitabha and raised by him as children are nourished by their mother and instructed by their father. We are not the creatures of Amitabha, but as children. Well, we've already found out that we're not, but um, remember when we say that when somebody does something bad to somebody else, it doesn't mean that it's something they deserve from a past life too. So when we are creatures of our own making, that's not what we mean. We're not victim blaming here. Um, I'm not anyways. Ask thy own self, whether thou art, because thou wast created by some extraneous power, or contrawise, whether it is not true to say that thou art, because thou dost will thine own existence. Every man is what he wills to be. You know, uh, both Thelema and Islam have got on this will. Do what thou wilt. Um, but Islam as well, you surrender that will unto God. Um, and the Vedic stuff, don't we have that, you know, the, the Soma can be a representative of consciousness. So Agni is the will. So you, through your will, you surrender your consciousness to Indra, the god of heaven, um, which is Bhagavan, but you know, you start with the more worldly realization. But thou hast become what thou art of necessity according to the norms that constitute the nature of Mataba, but thou grewest to be what thou art because thou wantest to become such. Now, if an Ishvara had created thee, Thou wouldst not have the feeling of freedom that thou now hast, but thou wouldst feel like the vessel made by the potter, which is what is in spite of its own like or dislike. But if I am determined to love life, acts Charaka, is it wrong to do so, and shall I be punished for it by suffering? Replied Ashvagosha. There is neither punishment nor reward, my son, though we may use the words in adapting our language to the common mode of thought. There is only cause and effect. The Tathagata gave no commandments. For what authority has anyone to command his brother beings? The Tathagata revealed to us the evils of life. 
and what people call the Ten Commandments are the Ten Ways pointed out by the Tathagata, how to avoid the Ten Evils. He who does not take the Tathagata's advice must bear the consequences. The tiger will be hunted down, and a murderer will be executed. Their fate is the result of their deeds. As to love of life, there is nothing wrong in it. If you love life, you must not be afraid of suffering. While the Tathagata lived in the flesh, he was as much subject to pain as I am, and as you are. But when the pangs of his last disease came upon him, he bore them with fortitude and did not complain. If you love life, bear its ills nobly, and do not break down under its burdens. Avail yourself to the light of Amitabha, for thus you can escape the worst evils of life, the contrition of regret, of remorse, of a bad conscience, and the noblest pleasure of life is that of becoming a lamp unto others. Let your light shine in the world, and you will be like unto your master, Buddha and Bittaba, the the omnibenevolent source of all illumination. And one thing that we um, should probably be regarding, right, is dryness and fear. But it's where these things come from, right? Guilt, shame, and fear are responses that teach us something. They're not the thing in themselves. 